Welcome to the Apartment Operators Podcast, where you can learn from experienced operators what it really means to be an apartment operator. No fluff, no sugarcoating, just the raw, unfiltered truth of the ups and downs of operating multifamily communities. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Operators Podcast. We're talking with multifamily operators. And today we have Dave Childress from Tennessee. Dave, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate you having me on today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, why would you take a couple minutes and tell the audience who you are, what you're doing, uh, and why you're here on the podcast? Yeah, so uh, I've owned uh, multifamily for a little over 15 years, and um, I love this podcast specifically because it's talking about operations, and that's kind of where I got my start. Was uh, I bought a 114 unit complex, and uh, I spent every day on it for many, many years, mowing grass, operating it, managing it, leasing it. Uh, during the, the downturn of the economy. So really I learned kind of the, the business. I, I tell people it's the MBA I got from actually running the property and um, living to tell about it, right? You know, I mean, uh, it was not uh, a magical business at that time. Just survival was everybody's, you know, name of the game at that point in 2010, eight, nine. Um, so I really learned everything from being on, a, on the property uh, dealing with tenants, we were just talking about that this weekend is, you know, you're dealing with tenants' lives. And if you have a thousand units, you have a thousand family units, right? Um, so the operational side, I'm very passionate about. I actually teach a lot of asset management classes here in Nashville, uh, just talking about this specific thing, because I think it's something that people leave out. They think they're going to raise capital, go find a deal, and, and it's mailbox money. And uh, you really, mostly if we see another downturn, you're going to have to be prepared to react quickly to uh, lowering rents or working with people and trying to keep them in place. And uh, um, so, yeah, I'm very passionate about the subject. So I'm, I'm very, very excited that you are diving into this subject and having guests. And I, I hope people listen to this podcast for that reason um, so they can get educated on some of the tricks of this trade. Yeah, well, you nailed it on the head, right? It, for me, it's kind of like, it's not all rainbows and lollipops. It's yeah. not all yeah. going to be awesome all yeah. the time. And you're not just raising money to buy a building. When you right. raise money and you buy this property, you're also buying uh, a lot of people that you're right. working with and you're yeah. providing shelter to, which is one of the most basic needs. Uh, right. So um, that's why I, I created this podcast because a lot of the education out there and the podcasts and the websites and the books are focusing on the sprint to yep. get to the closing table. And they forget to mention that after that sprint, there's a whole marathon of a few years where you're going to have to take care of a property and the tenants and everything else. So, yeah. so I heard you say that you were mowing grass and everything. That leads me to one of our most common question is, third party or a self-management app. Uh, yeah. Like so, so yeah, I, I kind of leveraged my time to get in this business by, you know, using my leveraging my time to, 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 to find partners. And, and that was kind of my responsibility was to manage it. And, and that's how I got started. Uh, I never want to go back to managing. Um, it's, but, but it, it taught me great lessons on how hard it is to sit there and manage a property and deal with, with these lives and, you know, people's drama that comes with it. Um, so it made me appreciate my managers, my leasing agents, my maintenance guys, you know, the maintenance guys are your front line, right? Um, and so having good maintenance guys with, uh, you know, great personalities that can, I told, told I used to tell them, you're, you got to talk these tenants off the cliff, right? Um, you, you know, you can make them jump or you can make them walk back um, and, and how your attitude is, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're letting them know that you're going to take care of things and everything will be all right, we're going to fix it. That's one thing, or, or do you antagonize it and make it worse? So, um, yeah, so self-management, um, this property that I, I was actually referring to that kind of gave my, my, my MBA, I got a HUD loan on it. And when HUD came in and said, you know, Dave, we're going to give you the loan, but you need to find third-party management because you're not so good at this. So I, uh, I, it was great. You know, it's been uh, five years now that's been under third-party management, and uh, I would never want to take it back. They've just done a tremendous job. Um, but I've had to learn now how to um, asset manage, right? So you go from being a manager and now you start hiring management companies and you have to know what to expect from them and how to direct them and, you know, making site visits. And, and so there's kind of a whole nother skill you have to learn. Um, so, so that's kind of my, my evolution. I started off with duplexes, have scaled up, sold the duplexes off, 
but um, have definitely, you know, if you find the right management company, it's, a, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, and I'd love to dig a little bit deeper into that in a second, but I want to kind of address one thing you said and, and ask more about that. Yeah. You said, I don't ever want to go back to it. <laughs> And I, I, I would go back if I had to, but I don't want to. Well, our experience when we talk uh, with other operators is that everybody starts off backwards from you, right? They start off as, as a third-party management, and then as they grow, they switch over to self-management because they feel they don't have the control or the quality that they're looking for. And you're saying the opposite completely, maybe because that you started at management. So... Uh, Tell me a little bit more about that shift that you made. I know HUD made you, but other than that, uh, why don't you want to get back to it? Or uh, are you not yet at the scale where you want to get back to it? So well, where, where are you on that? Yeah, I, I don't have enough doors centrally located to really, I don't think, build my own management company and have it make sense. Um, and, and I think for me, I, I know my skills and my weaknesses and managing people is really not a skill of mine. And, and it's really something I don't want to do. So I would rather third party have third party management um, and, and not have to be managing managers. Um, it's just where I'm at. And, and you're right. I mean, I, I work with different people that have, you know, 15, 20,000 units and they, they, you know, build their own management company. And I think they have the scale to do that. But uh, for me, I think my time is better spent, um, you know, well, go back. I'm a multifamily broker too. So I spend a lot of time brokering properties. Um, but it's also, uh, my time is better spent um, looking for deals than, than actually managing um, managers and a management company. So I guess I, I'm tr always trying to eliminate the jobs I have. And that's one that, you know, and mostly if you're buying for, you know, I bought one in Florida and, and they're not all again, centrally located. If I think if I had a management company, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I can hire in different regions for whoever the, the good players are in those markets versus trying to go in a market, learn it and experiment with a, my own management company. So, Okay, so let's dive right into that one. How do you hire a property manager? What are you looking for? What are you asking? What's important to you in the management partner? Yeah, I mean, one thing I think is obviously if you're buying a C-class asset, making sure you're finding a management company that, you know, manages C-class assets, right? Um, you know, because we've run into that where we've hired managers on different properties that have come from an A and they want to make your C-class an A-class, which is never going to happen. Um, and so, you know, I think that that goes into, you know, what their past experience is, the management company. Um, regionally, you know, are they, do they have regionals? Do they have uh, extra help in the area? Uh, the one management company now that I use for this big 114 unit, they they just do the county that we're in, and they have about 4,000 doors in that county, so they have a lot of help, right? So that one, one property, if it needs an extra assistant manager or a leasing agent or a maintenance guy for the day because the, the property has a call out, then it's very easy for them to you know pull somebody over. So so that was definitely an important uh, thing I think about is um, – you know, what else do they have in the area? You know, when it comes to contractors, you know, do they have subs that are on their list that they have a, um, you know, history with that they can call in to, to do some of the, the work? So th those are some of the big things I've looked for in the past. Okay. And, you know, a lot of companies out there are in the four to 6,000 uh, units range, which is what we, are, we like the same. Um, how do you really tell if they're good or not? Are you asking for references? Are you asking to see somebody else's rent roll? Um, yeah, I mean, how do you go about yeah. vetting them out? Yeah, I mean, that, you know, it's funny is when I bought the property in Florida, I think I reached out to about 10 different property management companies. And the one we went to with, actually, they followed up with us, which I was super impressed with. Um, a lot of them didn't even return my phone calls. So I, I guess I just crossed them off the list uh, from that alone. But yeah, I am maybe even getting, I know what I did is I got a list of properties that they managed and actually drove, drove the properties without them, you know, knowing that I, I was going to do that and uh, got to see kind of how the property presented itself when I just went through uh, and looked at it that way. And we did, we called a lot of people and, and verified that, you know, they would continue to work with them. So. Okay, great. Uh, so Describe your operations today, right? Uh, just so the, the listeners will have an idea of how many units, how many regions, right? It sounds like you're in multiple states. Um, 
And how does your team look like? Or is it just Dave is the team, right? So I'm the team. I'm the team. Okay. I'm the team, everything. Um, yeah, I guess what I've done different is um, I've partnered one-on-one -on -one with a lot of guys. So, and then a lot of things, a few things I own on my, on my own. Uh, done one syndication. So I think the portfolio is only like 300 and a little over 300 units, maybe a $30 million total. Um, and I own about 80% of that. So there's some that I own on my own, some that I've syndicated, some that I've partnered one-on-one -on -one with guys. So it's just me right now. Um, you know, that's kind of the plans for 2020 is to, to really grow it, go out. And um, I think I mentioned I was a broker. So I spent a lot of time brokering. Uh, and, and the plan is to, to remove me from that day to day and really get in the car, go meet with brokers, go, go, you know, view more properties. Uh, we're in the kind of a refinance stage right now with some of our properties, which is going to make us a little bit more liquid to, to actually go out. And um, I was just on the phone with a, uh, a broker about a 36 unit here in Tennessee that uh, I'm very intrigued about. So uh, today's Thursday, I'm hoping to drive over there on Monday and take a look at it. So, um, yeah, you know, I've, I've, I've brokered almost 500 multifamily deals since 2011 and uh, that's just kind of consumed me and um, I really want to get back uh, buy more assets. So. so that 300 unit portfolio, how many properties, individual properties is it? Uh, let's see, one, two, Probably. three, four, five, like six, six properties. Yeah. Okay. So they're, they're medium sized properties for the most yeah. part. Um, so that brings in another interesting aspect of operations. When you have a smaller property, like a 15, 20 unit pro property, you can't have on-site manager and on-site maintenance people. So how does that change the dynamic you have with a property management company? Yeah, so 114, we've got one manager, one maintenance guy. 86, we have one maintenance, one manager. 56, we've got a, a mom, a, I call it a mom and pop team. It's a husband and wife that work about 30 hours a week and they're pretty much able to do everything on that property. Um, but you know, your cost per unit when you're, when you're kind of running it that way, you know, the expense goes up. So I have a 14 unit in downtown Nashville and um, it's, it's managed by a, a real estate company that kind of, they treat it more like a single family home or a duplex would. They charge me an 8% management fee and then they charge me a, a lease up fee when they um, find a renter. But yeah, that, that, that smaller property, that 10 to 60 unit is, it's, it's definitely interesting in how you have to manage that. If it's in a big city, it's easier, but if you're buying maybe on a rural market, it's really hard. And so, you know, we're kind of always coaching people maybe to find a tenant that lives there that can help you out. Um, and, and uh, cause it can get quite expensive. You know, if you had a 50 unit and you're having to pay 8% or something, or, you know, pay a full-time person, it, it really can kill your deal. Yeah. Um, financially. So, um, and, and then I do own, I think I was mentioning a, a duplex and a single family home this year. We're going to get rid of those just because of the management intensity of those. Um, so I'm actually putting out some videos on my Facebook page, just, you know, came in after 4th of July and keys were slipped under the door from this duplex. They moved out in the middle of the night or in the weekend. And, uh, you know, just this, that's kind of like operational stuff that people don't want to really talk about. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, I hear you. So it sounds like you're working with multiple property management companies. So uh, let's take a step out right now and talk about the, the asset management side of things is how does your asset management structure look like? Do you talk to all the property management once a week or once a month? How, how does that look like in your world? Yeah, it just depends. Some properties are they're kind of on autopilot and the managers are great. And I talk to them once a month. Uh, I get their Monday reports and I look through their Monday reports and, um, you know, if I don't have any questions, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I don't need it. And then there's some that are a little bit more talking to them every other day. Right. And I'm probably doing a little bit more than I really want to on those, but that's kind of the stage that they're in. Um, the one that I've owned for 15 years, it's, it's, again, it's on autopilot for the most part, you know, you, once you take your eye off the ball, right. Then it, then yeah. it goes, you know, away. So, you know, making those uh, site visits without them knowing is something I do. I've got, like I said, I'm a property in Florida and I, I have to fly down there and nobody knows I'm coming until they see me sitting there uh, waiting for them. Um, but, you know, Monday reports, financials that you get from your, um, you know, pr property management company, you know, at the end of the month, we're always looking through those. Um, so, so that's kind of more on the asset management side. But yeah, we're working with multiple management companies and um, some do 
one thing great and another thing bad. So it's um, so that you can, again, you kind of learn what your expectations are. But um, you know, the Monday reports are key, really, to know what's going on um, at the property for the previous week. Okay, and for um, audience that doesn't know what a Monday report is, and, and every property management is a little bit different with the report. Uh, tell us a little bit about what are you looking for, and what is that weekly report you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, you know, they can get it as extensive as how much they've actually collected for the month. So we can still see what's outstanding, see what com is coming vacant, how many units are, are occupied, uh, how many are rent ready. Um, I like for them to all put my, the renewals that they have for the last week, because then I can kind of see trends, you know, if they're renewing their leases and rents are going up, um, then maybe on those vacants, we can, we can do a little rent bump. Um, but it really gives you just insight into how many leads they had, how many people, you know, the number I really look for is how many people they turned down, right. Yeah. You know, on their applications. Cause you know, if they're bringing 10, 10 applications and then they're approving all of them, then there's something wrong. So I want to yeah. see that they're, 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 you're actually screening tenants and turning people down. That's, that's always a good sign. Um, so, so, you know, they're, they're putting in there where they're getting their leads from, right. Uh, Facebook marketplace or, or signage or drive bys or whatever. Um, so you learn a lot from those reports that give you um, the ability to steer the ship as an owner uh, yeah. and which one you want to go. So It's also good to uh, um, look for where is your ROI, right? So we've used apartments.com and apartment finder and all kind of different online marketing techniques. And um, if we don't get that report coming back saying this is where the traffic came from, we don't have a way to value if our marketing dollars are spent well. Yeah. So uh, that's why we also track these things to kind of see uh, what's going on. We also see that it's like a funnel, right? You have traffic, you have applications, and you have how many leases. Yeah. And if there's a really off ratio in any one of those stages, then that's where we dig in. So for example, if I have 100 people in the traffic, but only one application, then we got a challenge with our leasing team probably because either they don't market correctly and everybody right. that comes in saying, well, that's not what you marketed right. or they don't know how to convert a traffic into an application. So, um, but sometimes it's not their fault. Sometimes it's something on the property, right? And, and yeah. that's where you want to claw out, out of them, right? What is that issue that they hear from prospects so we can handle that and, and they won't have that issue anymore. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I, I've had property management complain to me that, you know, this unit's not leasing up and, and they, you know, call me two months later and tell me it's because of this, you know, washer and dryer. Well, what, what would it cost for us to install washer and dryer connections, you know? Again, that's, that's information I need to digest and, and come up with a, a solution to that problem. Um, you know, we found some little units that you can stack and, and put on a little dolly and and hook up to your sink and and do all the washer and dryer and i don't even mind buying those and you know, i think they're eight hundred dollars um but if it's gonna land me another hundred dollars a month in rent or fifty dollars or or even just keep a good tenant there i'm willing to do stuff like that but it's that information that i need from the property and from like you said the leasing agent the management um you know to, to determine those and, and make a, a good business decision so yeah and you're you're funny about the um uh, talking about the return on your investment for advertising, you know, before I was sophisticated and I'm, not, I'm sophisticated now, but you know, I, I, when I was sitting on property, I would list out all the places I was marketing the property, you know, apartments.com, $800 a month, balloons, $10 a month, right? <laughs> Craigslist ad, zero. Yeah. I was getting 90% of my leads from putting balloons out. So they knew somebody was sitting there and then Craigslist ads. And so I eventually just got rid of apartments.com and a lot of those expensive at that time, rent.com, which was a part of eBay would charge you four or five or whatever, 50% of the rent. And it was very, very expensive. And uh, so I just started saying, man, we're not going to do that stuff. We're just going to grass or, uh, you know, just do the grassroots type thing. We're, we're by a big uh, university. So we'd go out and pass out biscuits to students and, you know, just uh, go to, um, laundromats and pull a little tabs, you know, the pull down tabs, um, you know, and, and I always used to say like, you know, we're not trying to get a $600 renter or a thousand dollar a month renter. We're trying to sign a 12,000 or a 6,000 annual lease, right? So if you put it in that perspective, um, but yeah, definitely tracking where you're spending your marketing dollars. And that's why right now I'm a huge fan of um, 
Facebook marketing, you know, setting up a page for the property and, and boosting ads, boosting posts and pausing it and targeting. And there's, there's so much you can do with Facebook advertising that now people are catching on, but we've been doing that for a couple of years now. And it's, it's a great, great tool. Yeah. Facebook marketplace is one of our biggest drivers of, of traffic. And, um, you, you mentioned biscuits. We do donuts, right? So yeah. we'll go to, uh, firehouses or police stations or nursing homes and just walk around with donuts and, and, uh, some flyers and everybody loves donuts. Well, that was one of the things we really did when the, when the economy was bad is we'd go to the good tenants and say, Hey, we want your friends to live here and we want to reward you. You know, what, don't you want to make two or $300? And so we would do that. So we'd have, you know, 10, 15, well, maybe not 10, 10 to five to 10 units full of maybe one, one company where all these people work together and, and they were just referring everybody. And, and so that's, that goes back to taking care of tenants, right? taking yes. care of maintenance issues. You know, we could just talk about tenant retention and just taking really, really good care of people and, and the customer service aspect that keeps your tenants in place and makes them live, you know, in the same, you know, home for 20 years. Um, and then we don't have to talk about turns and you're still taking their rents up slowly. So, you know, tenant retention is huge. Um, and just, I, I'm a huge fan of being a good landlord, good multifamily owner, taking good care of my tenants um, because they'll take care of you. Yeah, I'm smiling here because it's like you're reading off of my list of questions. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you just keep. I told you, right man, to I love this one. subject. Like, I love this subject. I love teaching it because, you know, as a broker, I've seen bad owners, a lot of bad owners, and, and I've seen a lot of us make money off bad owners, right? And, uh, yep. man, I, I told, uh, maybe I'm not going to share that story, but I mean, there's some, <laughs> some, some landlords in this business that honestly, they should be in jail, is my opinion. You know, they don't take care of their tenants and, and that's not what we're here. To, we're here to make money, but we provide what you said, like a service. We're providing them, you know, housing, uh, their home and, and I respect their home and I want to take care of their home. And I know if I take care of their home, they're going to take care of me. Um, and so it's a, it's a huge subject right now, man. Cause I, I think, you know, if you're overpaying for something right now in apartments, then, then that's where you're going to start trying to, 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 to make up numbers, right. Is spend mm -hmm. less on maintenance and, and upgrades and you you, or, or I see owners is taking out all that money and maybe stick in their pocket and not reinvesting in the property. And that that's very, very frustrating because that's not how the business is supposed to go. Yeah. So let's, let's go deeper. Um, what do you guys do on your properties, uh, to increase retention? Oh man, How, you, you know, events, parties, yeah, uh, um, yeah. you mentioned the referral program, but anything that our listeners can take and implement on their properties. Definitely adding, you know, um, cheap amenities if we can, right? So uh, playgrounds, dog uh, walking areas, dog, dog areas. Um, I mean, it can be as simple as um, uh, one of my properties added a coffee station in the office, right? Free coffee. And she said, you know, it's funny how many people stop in here every morning to have, you know, get their coffee. And, and we have a variety and all the, all the little goodies to go along with it. You know, little things like that, birthday cards to, to uh, tenants and their kids, um, you know, at Chris, summer parties, you know, all, all by the swimming pool, um, any kind of community event that you can add like that. Um, you know, book clubs, DVD clubs, I think that's probably on the way out. Um, but, but a lot of those things, it doesn't take, you don't have to add a million dollar swimming pool like my friend just did. Um, if he ever listens to this, he'll laugh. Um, but you, you know, you can spend, you know, a couple thousand dollars on a nice little playground. Um, uh, you know, so there's, there's a lot of little cheap, um, cheap, affordable amenities that you can add um, to make people feel like they're part of a community. And, um, uh, Wi-Fi, you know, like well, one place we have has got a real nice uh, outdoor seating area. So we have Wi-Fi there and uh, a lot of the kids come after school and hang out, um, you know, in these anirondic chairs and, and sit around and are able to log into the internet and um, right there by the office. So that's that's been a big hit for that property as well. Yeah, uh, it's funny you mentioned that, but one of the affordable amenities that we found is a $100 popcorn machine. Oh yeah, and and it's funny because it's great for leasing. It generates really good smell in the office, and then prospects right. can get it. But we also tell uh, all the kids in the property when you come back from school, just swing by, and grab a, a bag of popcorn, and they, they a lot of them come in. And um, 
I don't remember where I, I, I okay, now I remember uh, a good <laughs> friend of ours, Maureen Miles. Oh, yeah. Uh, she, she's the one that told us this little secret. It's kind of like kids come in and they talk. Right. And then you <laughs> learn know. who's doing what on the property and right. where. So, so it's, it's also an extra added bonus on, on the back end as well. Uh, but I, I've been in the office when they come in and get some popcorn and the mom is in the background. And when that kid gets all smiley with a bag of popcorn, that mom automatically smiles as well. Right. Okay. So, so that goes a long way to what you just said about making them feel a part of the community, making them feel that they're, somebody cares about them on right. the property. Yeah, I've seen them do, you know, Christmas decoration awards, Halloween type things and and the coffee, you know, cure I'm sitting here looking at my Keurig, you know, they have a Keurig machine in there with hot cocoa, different types of coffees, teas. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of a lot of little things like that just connecting with your tenants, you know, knowing that we're not just here to take your money. Um, you know that we really do care. So uh uh, renewal bonuses. Uh, that's an, uh, actually, let's talk about that. You know, doing something to improve the unit as a, a, to keep a tenant and retain, you know, retain, retain that tenant. It could be changing out the mini blinds or putting up a uh, ceiling fans, just cleaning their carpets. Uh, that went a long way. Um, yeah. you know, back, uh, you know, just say, Hey, well, you know, you sign a new lease, we'll come in there and uh, put new blinds, you know, cost us a hundred dollars and then get your carpets cleaned. And they just, you know, the tenants have lived in it for six years, right? And you're cleaning it every year. It just helps you, right? Yes. Um, and so, uh, you know, just just taking care of tenants is, the, is a huge, huge thing, so. Yeah, uh, one more thing you mentioned, holidays and stuff like that, is on Halloween, we basically ordered a $20 worth of face paint kit from Amazon and send up a flyer saying, come on in and we'll do face paint for you, right? And, right. you know, kids come in and, and, you know, get a little bit of face paint and everybody's happy and they can go trick or treating with this thing. And um, it it's, it's, doesn't have to be expensive. Yeah, right? no, People right. don't expect necessarily expensive, big grandeur things. It could be as small thing as a $20 face paint kit. And um, as an owner and as a community, you also get a lot of pictures of kids getting into their face right. painted and all that. You upload that to the community website and to the Facebook, helps with marketing, helps with traffic, helps with everything else. So um, uh, like you said earlier, if you give, you'll get back. And that's- yeah. uh, Well, uh, and back to the, the, the gift card too, we used to do like an early bird special, right? So if you got your rent in before the first of the month, you were entered in for a you know, $25 gift card. Um, you know, to early bird. And another thing about the gifts too, is if you do a party, like we've done a few in the summertime, we'll get all of our vendors to give gifts, right? Yes. Or some kind of prizes. So we don't even have to buy them. We get them to go down and get gift cards from Starbucks or the pizza, the pizza place that wants to market on our property and come and pass out flyers. Well, yep. We're going to ask you for some free pizzas uh, for the party. Um, you know, Lowe's, you know, some of these vendors we use, you know, we, we offer, you know, we ask them to cough up, you know, some of these, you know, it doesn't, like you said, it doesn't have to be hundreds of dollars, but, you know, and so they pretty much pay for some of these parties as well. So. Yeah. Um, AT&T, Cricket Wireless, uh, cable companies, these are all great. We even had a hairdresser come out for a back to school event uh, and give kids free uh, haircuts. That, that was really great. So you're absolutely right. Sometimes you can even get somebody else to pay for it. Yeah. Um, so, so that's really great. So we set, up, we set up a model unit one time and just, we only needed it for like three months. So we were just kind of in a lease up phase and we got one of the local, you know, um, uh, rental furniture places to, to put the furniture in there and, you know, their flyers, we were giving them out to every tenant that moved in. Uh, and so, you know, we, we sent them on quite a bit of business for just allowing us to set up. Uh, for them bringing, you know, just a few pieces of furniture to furnish a unit, and make it look like a model. So that was another way, you know, the, uh, to to get some tenants, and we didn't have to spend any money. So yeah, that's fantastic. I think our listeners are getting a lot of great ideas uh, today. Uh, so uh, you, you kind of went that route and then stopped yourself, right? So give us a little bit of a horror story and then a funny story, right? Because I know you have a lot from both. Mm. Uh, and yeah, what can I share? Uh, yeah, let's uh, keep it PG thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> and um, geez, I'm trying to think horror stories, man. I, um, man, I, oh, you put me on the spot here. Um, I, obviously doing eviction setouts, 
you know, people trashing units, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think, I, you know, I, again, I'll refer back to this story just even this, this year, 4th of July coming in and there's keys, you know, underneath the door and I go and find this unit vacant and, um, you know, middle of July or, you know, into July. So, you know, I had to spend about $5,000 to turn that unit that wasn't planning on it. Um, I hate things like that. Um, horror stories, funny stories, man, I'm trying to think. Um, I'd say sometimes bugs, you know, like the, 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 the bed bugs kind of, kind of gross me out. Um, roaches, you know, you open a door and they fall on your head, right? Cause they're in that crack above the door. Um, that's probably the grossest thing, um, that I can talk about here, um, that we've had to deal with, but, uh, you know, um, a lot, a lot of filthy people, you know, I've, I've learned that in this business, uh, you know, a college female college girls are gross. I learned that, um, I, uh, they don't know how to run a vacuum cleaner or wipe it. They might be neat and their apartment might look neat, but they're, they're pretty, they're pretty gross to me. Um, I learned that college students, uh, um, a funny story. I had a unit that a gentleman came in real quick. He said, man, my electric bill on this little 800 square foot unit was like five or $600. And he said, man, there must be something wrong with the electrical. And I said, well, I'll send an electrician down there. This is in the middle of summer, middle Tennessee, you know, it's probably 105 with the heat index. So the electrician comes back. He said, man, there's nothing wrong with the electric. He said, it's the AC. I said, well, what's wrong with the AC? He said, the guy has the unit set at 50 degrees. Mm -hmm. And I said, what? He said, yeah, that, it's just running constantly. So the gentleman, you know, young guy, I think he was a freshman in college, sophomore, he came in. I said, man, there's nothing wrong with your electrical. I said, but your, your AC unit can't keep up. You know, it only can drop it so many degrees. And, and he just had no clue. He thought everybody kept it at 50. I said, it probably needs to be more like 75. And so I said, that will probably help your electric bill. So it's kind of head scratchers like that, that you're just like, man, like how, how have you survived this long in, in life? Um, you know, so, uh, yeah, I'd say those are kind of some of the funny stories that, you know, you just, you just, you just scratch your head. Okay. Um, now let's get serious again about operations. Oh, now we got to go back that way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and talk about increasing, uh, value add, right. Increasing income, right. Three, yeah. two, three ways that is not the obvious raise rent, uh, um, or raise occupancy, uh, two, three things that you guys do on your properties to increase the income. Uh, always rebidding insurance. I think that's a big thing is always having, you know, re, you know, on the expense, the side, expense let's talk side, let's talk about the income. We'll come oh, back you want to talk the about income. income. Okay. So um, no free passes. <laughs> um, well, right now, a prime example is we're replacing all the appliances at one property. Again, back to your property management company gave me a very good suggestion, something I wasn't even thinking about because I'm not there, right? They're, they're getting the feedback from the tenants. And they said, we think if you replace all these appliances with new black ones, we've got the old Allman, you know, probably 15 years old. We think we can get six, $69 more a month for every unit just by putting right. black appliances. So, you know, they started buying the, a package as a stove a fridge and a uh, hood vent for um, $1,000 and we're getting a $69 rent bump. Well, if you do the math, it's about a $900,000 increase in, 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 in value just by doing something simple like that. Uh, on a six and a half cap, it was $70,000 NOI increase. So, you know, simple things like that. Um, you don't always have to go for the home run. Maybe it's $5 or $10 here or there. Um, you know, so uh, every dollar counts. Every dollar counts, and mostly every dollar counts when you're on a hundred units, two hundred, three hundred units. The multiplies. Right. Um, I love apartment complex math. That's what I tell people because um, you know five dollars here and there. And so you know when you meet these um, owner or owner operators, mom and pops that are saying, "Oh, it's only five dollars. It's only ten dollars." As you know, you're probably losing hundreds of thousands of dollars in value. Um, so, so the appliances, um, you know, upgrade and flooring, you know, um, pet, pet rents, pet leases, things like that are something that we commonly do. Um, I'm trying to think on the income side right now, um, what we're doing. Uh, honestly, I really, a lot of these things I, I don't deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Let's switch You're over to there? the expense oh. side. Dave? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, my okay. internet or some internet just froze. So, Okay. So uh, let's switch over to the expenses side of things and um, give us a couple of things over there, right? You mentioned the insurance, rebidding the insurance. Hold on, you're frozen again. Okay, because I got your picture frozen. 
There you go. You're back online. Can you see me? Yep, I can see you. Okay. Okay. Um, Haley will have to edit this out, so give her three seconds of silence and start again. Okay, so let's switch over to the expense side of things. Uh, I, you mentioned rebidding the insurance. Give us a couple of things. Yeah, yeah uh, I think even on the, the renovation side or turn, turns of a unit, making sure that you know, you're doing the right things um, that actually see a return on your investment. So you know, got, not going overboard on some of your renovations. Um, I know a lot of people are using like vinyl plank right now. We're still using sheet vinyl because um, it's just a lot more affordable. Um, you know, and just all your vendors. I think you got to go through all your vendors. Um, well, for, for, here's a prime example, uh, 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 Trash, right? You know, you, there's one company with a W and an M um, that just loves to go up with their um, uh, trash dumpster fees every year on an escalation clause for no reason. And if you don't call them out on it, they don't do anything. Uh, so I actually met a lady here in Nashville. That's all she does is rebid trash. And uh, she saved me thousands, I'd say a, a year on some of my even smaller properties. And so, you know, making sure just going through there and uh, all your line items and just seeing if there's anything at landscaping, you know, can you, can you rebid it out? Um, mm -hmm. and, and so anything that, you know, it has any kind of contract on it annually, you need to be going back and looking at those contracts and seeing if there's any way to, to save yourself a, a money there. You know, one of my properties I bought had a master cable contract on it and it wasn't common for the marketplace. It was costing me $33,000 a year to have basic cable in everybody's apartment. And so we eliminated that. And, you know, there was definitely a, you know, 10% of the property that was not very happy with that. But, um, you know, the rest of the property didn't really care because the basic cable wasn't what they wanted. They wanted nice internet and, you know, a better package. Um, yeah. So, so that was one, one thing that we've always done, but I think on the renovation side, you know, finding the right vendors, um, to, to do your turns is huge. You know, finding that flooring company, if you're going to use third party that, uh, specifically does, um, you know, apartment complex type of flooring. Yeah, I know. That's a, that's a really good tip uh, on the renovation, right? Take a look around what everybody else is doing. Don't do under that because you won't be able to get your return on your money, but don't overdo because, again, you won't see a return on your money. So if right. the market is at uh, vinyl sheets, there's no point in doing planks, but if everybody in the market is doing planks, you don't right. want to be the last one still doing sheets, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's a really good point. Uh, so if you look at a young operator, somebody that just syndicated their first deal or uh, 1031 from a fourplex into a 20 unit, uh, what would be your, your best advice? Um, find that good management company because again, I, 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 I'm going to drill down on this. If you find that good property management company, they know what the market you know, should, you should have, if you should have vinyl plank or, or sheet vinyl, they know the improvements you should make. Is it on the HVAC units or is it putting, you know, tile or is it replacing, um, you know, the, uh, um, what were we just talking about? We were just talking about something, uh, the appliances, you know, they're going to tell you, you know, what the biggest bang for your buck you're going to get. And they have all those relationships set up. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing is, you know, you're paying for their advice and their education almost, you know, honestly. Um, so, so find a good, good property management company and make sure you're looking at, you know, first thing I do is when I go to look at different markets is, is, is there multiple property management companies available in that market? Cause I've made that mistake. I've bought properties where, you know, I'm kind of honestly having to really handhold or, or, or do a lot of property management stuff on, on my own that I never planned to because the market's too small or the property's too small. And, um, and I've kind of been spoiled in some of my other properties. So it's, it's one of those little learning curves, learning things that I've made is making sure that you're looking in markets that have, you know, not just one, but a couple management company as options uh, if you don't plan to do it yourself. But, you know, line yourself, listen to those people and, and have realistic expectations. I think you and I have talked about this. Um, some of these people think they're going to buy a property and in, in 60 days or one, even one year, they're going to double the rents. And I'm just like, man, this is not realistic. And if the property was vacant, you know, yes. But what are you going to do with, you know, miss little old lady that's your grandma that's been living there for 35 years? Are you going to kick her to the, you know, out? And, you know, there's just a, you know, again, back to you're dealing with people's lives. So set your expectations, you know, realistically. And, and if you don't know those, reach out to yourself or me or, or somebody that knows what they're doing to, to analyze and look at that deal and tell you if you're crazy or not. And, 
Um, I feel like I talk more people out of not buying properties these days um, than I talk them into buying properties because of things like that. So, yeah, well, we're both brokers, right? My right. my listeners know that I'm a broker too of multifamily, and uh, we both see other brokerage. I'm not going to name names, but the big guys out there, right, that have extremely optimistic performers with. Right. Uh, stuff in there that basically suggests that whoever built this performer has never operated a property, right? Yeah. If they put a 1% loss to lease year one, it's kind of like, it tells me that you're going to spend so much money on CapEx on turning units because 1% means you take the guy that pays $760 a month and kick him out because the market rate says 795, right? right? Um, right. And it'll take you four years to see your money back, but hey, you got market rent. Right. So uh, that's <laughs> that's really where uh, um, you got to build these things into your underwriting a little bit better, uh, because again, looking at the closing table is one thing, but remembering that at the end of that sprint, there's a whole marathon of operations that awaits you is something that a lot of people kind of not considering these days. Well, and just on the expense side too. I mean, I, you know, I tell people go down in that marketing package to the total expense divided by the number of units. And if it's 1900, 2000 a door, there's no way, you know, you're not going to run it that cheap and, and you got to be realistic. You know, some of these little, you know, 80 unit complexes, I'm, I'm at 5,000 a door expense rate, you know, I mean, it's just what it is. And, you know, I could probably try to shave off, you know, some of it's insurance because of the location in Florida, but you know, it's expensive to run these proper properties the right way. Now I tell people, if you're going to go live in that city and you're going to mow the grass and you're going to manage it and you're going to be the leasing agent and the cleaning lady and everything else, then yeah, you might be able to run it at that. But to be an investor is different than that. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so just be realistic on those expenses um, of what they're, and then you got to put money away for that you know, oh shit time. Right. And the, <laughs> the, the, the things that you just don't know that are going to happen, you know? Um, so, um, you know, the, the oh, man. so you're, you're touching on so many critical points. <laughs> I just want to re recapture. A few I told of them you, man, I love this stuff. <laughs> I love this stuff. So, uh, just a few things to recapture for our audience, right? So, uh, the, the cost to operate a unit is going to fluctuate a lot based on the property size, location, age, right? Obviously, running a 2012 Amen. property is going to be cheaper than running a, 2000, a 1964 property right. just because it's newer. If you have right. a pool, that's cost. If you don't have a pool, you don't have that cost. If you're in a flood zone or a hurricane zone like Florida, it's going to cost you a lot more than, I don't know, West Texas. Um, so it, it's really, it's a lot of factors and you can't just put everything into the same box and expect everything to average out at the same spot. Let, and, let's stop right there. Let's stop right there. Stop using 50% expense ratio crap. Because that that just, you know, that is not, maybe it's a good place to go, should I pursue it deeper and spend more time? But don't use that, okay? People, please, please don't just say, oh, it's going to be 50% expense ratio, okay? So let's go yeah, on. Yeah, I, I, had, I had to say that. So and, and no, really, there's a lot of, industry benchmarks out there and it's not that they're not true they're absolutely true because it's an industry-wide right. average but you look at a 200 unit that sits on four acre of contract concrete and 200 units that sits on 20 acres of grass their landscaping cost yep. is going to be dramatically different but they will average out at the industry benchmark Right. right. So while the industry average might be true, you got to really look at the property that you're buying and to understand your operating costs. Yeah, uh, and you're mowing, you're mowing in Florida is going to be more than in Michigan. Right. But then you're going to have snow removal, snow right? Removal. Michigan. So, it, you know, it, it, you just got to look in and understand that's what it, I'd say a mistake I made that luckily I had enough wiggle room in the deal was the insurance in Florida, you know, it cost me a, a lot. It was double what it is here in middle Tennessee. You know, and then hurricanes come and storms and your insurance rate goes like this. Yeah. And um, so, again, I had enough room in there and that was a, a lucrative enough deal to where it I absorbed that that uh, oh moment. Um, and so you got to be prepared for those type of times. So, and, and that's another point I wanted to recapture for our audience is that you 
I've seen a lot of underwriting from investors that kind of assume that if they need $100,000 to close, they need $100,000. Well, yeah. you can operate a 50 unit or 100 unit or 200 unit property with zero dollars in the bank day one. Right. Even if you close on the first of the month, it still takes a while until you raise your money, until you collect your rent. Uh, you have payroll, you have vendors that needs to be paid, you'll have deposits when you get started. So uh, we bought a property that had a three-year-old boiler on it, right? And a year later, that boiler died. $25,000 expense that we did not see coming. If we didn't have that in reserves, everybody talk about, well, we put reserves, $300. A, yeah, but that takes a while until it <laughs> yeah, builds to up. Build, to build up, right, right. So, uh, yeah, definitely have a rainy day fund uh, aside of what you raise for buying the property just for operations. That's, that's So, really so let me point. talk about that. You know, I have a HUD loan and HUD, you know, makes me maintain a couple hundred thousand dollar uh, reserve account for that. And there's days that it frustrates me because they have that much money tied up. But then there's days where I just don't have to worry about things, right? Because yeah. I know... There, that property is super, super liquid, and that's how they're able to make it non-recourse and, and, and make it a 35-year loan. Um, so I'm thankful for that in, in those times. Like you said, you, you just I went down to Florida the other day, and they said, man, we've got to put this $7,000 sewer pump in. I didn't even know we had a sewer pump, right? It's like a grinder pump. And they said, we fixed it, we fixed it, but it's finally time to replace it, $7,000. I was like, well, I guess, you know, we just have to bite the bullet and, uh, you know, and, and replace it. Um, or maybe we budgeted for it this year and, and we hadn't put it in the budget. So yeah, I mean, you definitely, you definitely need to, you know, be ready for those type of things, like you said. Yeah. Awesome, man. This has been fantastic. Uh, one last question I usually ask all of our uh, guests is if you could go back in time and talk to young Dave, right? And no, you cannot tell him that 2009 <laughs> is the bottom. Bye, 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 bye in 2009. Uh, 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 other than that, what would you, what would you, what's the best advice you would give to young Dave? Okay. So get coaching, you know, um, get good coaching. Um, I've really learned this business just trial and error. And it's actually not, you know, recently where I've gotten in mastermind groups and, and gone to more conferences and, and reached out and learned. I, I did it. I learned a lot just from doing it. And I wish I would have spent and I wish I would have had the funds, I guess, back in those days uh, when I was starting Dave, to find um, good coaches, good, good training. Um, I think Dave, you got frozen. It says the internet is unstable. Can you hear me still? Oh, uh, you, you were frozen for a minute. So let's take it back a little bit. Um, just answer the question Can you hear again. Me yet? Shake your head. Shake my head. Nope. No, not yet. Oh, is it I can hear you. You're still I, there? I see you move. Yeah, I'm here. I'm still here. Yeah, you Okay, you got frozen too now. Uh, can you hear me? Let's keep trying. Can you hear me? Dave? Haley, I'm sorry, you're going to have a lot of editing on this one. Dave? Hello, I'm just going to get, ah, uh, we lost you. Okay. Ha. Huh. There you go. Okay. Let's just uh, wrap up. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, you want to just ask me a question again? Yeah. I'm just going to ask the question. Okay. Right. Okay. So a question we ask a lot of our guests is if you could go back in time to uh, 10, 20 years ago when you just got started, what would be the best advice for young Dave? Assuming you cannot tell yourself that 2009 is the bottom line of it, right? Yeah. Um, I think just, you know, spend time learning this business. Follow guys like me or yourself or, or uh, you know, uh, intern in the business. And, and I think on the, on, on the property side, I think that's probably one of the most important things. I think uh, learning how these properties operate um, on the operational side. But, but even if you have to pay, pay for training, pay for coaching, um, 
you know, you're, I would have made a lot less mistakes, probably made a little bit more money if I would have spent some money up front. I didn't have it. Um, but I learned the business just from school hard knocks. And, uh, you know, I, I wish I could have combined that with some professional coaching and kind of put them together. So that would be my advice is before you jump in and, and, and people are going to take that the wrong way because then they're going to study this for years and never buy anything. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying, you know, really learn or associate or team up, you know, with uh, super successful people uh, that have a, a proven track record that have done it. Yeah, that's great. Uh, well, I want to thank you so much. This has yeah. been an awesome interview. Uh, a lot of really great nuggets for our listeners. Uh, why won't you tell our listeners where they can find you? If they want to reach out, if they want to send you a referral for your broker business, or they want to buy in uh, Tennessee, uh, how can they find you? Yeah, so you can find me on uh, Facebook, Dave Childers. It's C H I L D E R S. Uh, on Instagram, uh, I don't really use Instagram for business, but uh, you know, if you call me on my cell phone. I'll give you my cell phone number. It's six one five four seven nine eighty seven thirty seven. Um, you know, connect with me that way. Look at Cedar Rock Cap. Dot com. So Dave at Cedar Rock Cap, all one long big word, cedarrockcap.com. Uh, more information about me, contact me there. Um, you know, search me out. I'd love to talk. Great. And we'll put all those uh, contact uh, methods in the show notes. I want to say thank you again. Uh, been an, a pleasure. Yeah, well, thank, thank, thank you again for, you know, putting your time and effort into putting a great podcast like this on a subject that we need to be talking a little bit more about. And, uh, you know, I hope your listeners uh, will watch all of these and um, really learn about the operational side of, a, of this business. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for us, the li for you, the listeners. If you want to find more about us, aptopr.com, that's our website. Uh, we put all of the videos on YouTube and we're on iTunes, teachers, subscribe. Give us a rating. We we'll appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for listening to our show. If you want to enjoy more episodes, please subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. For questions or feedback, please visit our site at www.aptopr.com.